Hey guys, so this is AP World History, Chapter 36, New Conflagrations, World War II and the Cold War. Alright, so today we're going to be covering uh, exactly what it says in the title, World War II and the Cold War. So it's a lot of information, and again, like I said, for the most part, you probably are very familiar with the European side of World War II, but not as familiar with the Eastern uh, Asian side of World War II. So make sure that you pay attention to what's happening there. As well as that, in terms of the Cold War, make sure you pay attention to policies uh, implemented by the U.S. as well as um, wars that you may not have recognized, such as the Korean War. So let's go ahead and get started. So starting off first with the origins of World War II. So Japan's war in China. So China was the first to experience um, the World War II horrors. The Japanese, remember, they invaded China using various methods of warfare, um, such as aerial bombings, um, just regular bombings as well, fire lances, that kind of thing. So the Japanese, uh, they automatically felt racially superior to the Chinese, and they were kind of on this imperialistic movement where they almost wanted to have a total control of the Asian area in the East, in the Pacific. So... The Rape of Nanjing was when they went into China, and it was called the Rape of Nanjing because while in there, they raped about 7,000 Chinese women, and they killed uh, thousands of unarmed soldiers. The equipment they had in comparison to that of Japan was very limited, and so it became easy for the Japanese to kind of just go in and assert their force. A lot of them, like I said, um, used these Chinese soldiers, unarmed soldiers, as bayonet practice. So it was really brutal, really hostile environment. And like I said, they were the first ones to really experience um, World War II, what would be World War II. So the Chinese, they did resist throughout the war. Chinese resisted throughout the war. And Chinese nationalists and socialists united against the Japanese. Because remember, during this time in China, they're having their own internal political problems where they're kind of you know going back and forth in terms of the kind of government that they're going to have some are supporting a democratic government others want a more socialist and communist government but when the Jap Japanese come in and begin to attack they kind of both say well you know what let's put our you know our disagreements aside and we're going to have to work on a united front together so they did, but the thing about this was that the coalition was weak and a lot of them began to have their own agendas in place, especially when they would uh, take control of an enemy territory. They felt that, oh, well, it's under we as communists, even though we're supposed to be working all together, we're communist Chinese people and we're going to take and control this territory for ourselves. So it created a lot of tension between the two and that was one of the weak points of this Chinese coalition. They also, the communists, used guerrilla warfare, and it was not very successful, but it garnered more Chinese support. The fact that the communists were, the Chinese communists were willing to do whatever it took by any means necessary to protect the Chinese, that really spoke to the peasantry um, that was living there. And it's going to be a big reason for the peasantries to support communism, and it will help communism later on after the war establish itself in Japan, I'm sorry, in China. So the Japanese invasion of China was, um, was obviously not supported internationally. The League of Nations that was, you know, composed after World War I did not support it, and Japan, who was a part of this League of Nations, they left because Essentially, they wanted, again, to kind of take control of all of the Pacific. So by them not being supported by the League of Nations, pretty much said, well, you know what, we're going to leave the League and we need to do what we need to do for our country if we want to have this control over the Pacific. So they left and they just focused on a very nationalistic and militaristic um, agenda. Moving over to the Western side into Europe, we see Italian and German aggression. So Italy with Benito Mussolini uh, made promises to gain territory not given to them after World War One. Again, remember, 
um, Mussolini was very upset that after World War I, they did not earn any territories in any of the treaties that ended the war. And this really upset them. So he took it upon himself to go in and invade Ethiopia. And again, the League of Nations, they did nothing about this. They, and they really couldn't. They had no um, political power to do anything. So later on, as World War II progresses, we will we'll see that Italy will side with the Axis powers. In regards to Germany, of course, they broke the Treaty of Versailles. Uh, remember, this treaty told them that they had to pay for war reparations. It took away, it demilitarized them, I mean, it took away their army, their navy, and it took um, parts of the Rhineland, parts of their territory from them. So he pretty much broke all of this treaty. And he resented these harsh terms that were given to them in the treaty. And he'll really come into power in 1933, and he'll do it legally. He'll become chancellor of Germany. And for him, he said the internal enemies were the Jews, the communists, and the liberals. And he said that in order to strengthen Germany, we have to remilitarize, meaning that even though it's not a part of what we're supposed to be doing, we need to do it if we want to you know, be a force to be reckoned with. So he called for remilitarization and he did, and it was denied, which denied, was denied by the treaty. Again, this is something that he could not do, but he still did it anyways. He also withdrew from the League of Nations and this should have been a big, obviously red flag for the League. If you're going to leave the League, that means you're not going to be somebody who wants peace in the world. So that should have drawn a red flag towards them. Uh, it reinstated military he so he reinstated military service and he entered the demilitarized Rhineland so everything that was a part of the treaty he broke and then we see Anschluss which was a union he wanted an Anschluss he wanted to integrate all Germans into a single homeland and that was his main goal to create this German homeland this German empire the the Reich the third Reich that's what um, uh, Reich means empire um, he gained Sudetenland and part of Czechoslovakia as well while he was doing this. And as he's acquiring, as he's breaking these things, he's, you know, remilitarizing. He is trying to, you know, he get part of the Rhineland and he got part of Czechoslovakia. They see what's going on. You know, the Western powers see what's going on and they have a conference called the Munich Conference. And essentially, what happens here is that Germany says, look, these are the lands we want. You give us these lands and we'll leave you alone. And the people, Italy, France, Germany, and Great Britain, they agree to appease Hitler and give in to his terms. And they concede the territory to him because they felt that it was more important to have peace for our time than to go into another world war because they had already experienced that and that was the last thing they wanted. So in exchange, he says that he's not going to expand. Just give me these lands and we're good. They do it and they think that's the end of it. But um, Hitler does not obviously keep his promise and he will attempt to invade Poland. And this is pretty much where Great Britain and France, they intervene and say, you know what? No, this cannot happen. You're breaking the agreement that we had at Munich and it will be the start of war on the western front so Italy they see the power that Germany has and they see how easily they gave in to uh, Germany's request and they will align themselves with Germany Russia also sees what has happened with Germany and how everybody has been so conciliatory to them that um, they create the treaty, the Russian-German Treaty of Non-Aggression, which is pretty much said that they're not going to attack each other and that they were going to be neutral with each other. That was the agreement. We're not going to attack and we're going to be neutral. So obviously this is going to all lead into, you know, total war, the world under fire. So the Blitzkrieg, uh, German conquerors of Europe, the fall of France. So the Blitzkrieg was... Um, just think of it in football, those of you who know football, a blitz, it's a full-on attack on the quarterback. So it's very similar in that effect, the Blitzkrieg. It was a full-on attack, especially an aerial bombardment of 
a country they were trying or a territory they were trying to gain. So the Blitzkrieg led many nations defeated by the Nazis because it was a tactic that had never been seen before. And um, when it came to acquiring France, before France could even kind of put up a fight, they gave in and said, you know what, we'll just sign an armistice with the Germans. And they did this in June. So convince Mussolini that Germans are winning the war and he wanted to reap the benefits. And so that's when uh, Mussolini really goes on the offensive and begins to acquire territory for Italy because remember he felt that it was denied to them after the World War after World War One. So as Germany is moving from territory to good territory, gaining land, acquiring it into its Third Reich, so to speak, the next obvious um, battle or engagement is going to be with Britain. And we see this with the Luftwaffe. And what this is, is the German Air Force used was using an attempt to defeat Britain because, remember, the British had created this sort of blockade, this huge armada around itself. So Hitler knew that this type of naval battle would not be suitable for the Germans and they would lose. So this all alternative of a lightning strike, kind of a lightning war where they're just throwing down bombs, throwing down bombs on Britain, they felt this would be the most effective. And they coupled that with the Blitz, a series of aerial attacks. So continual full force all on um, aerial bombings. And it really hurt them. It killed about 40,000 British. But the British royal forces were able to stave them off. They were able to keep them away. And eventually the bombing stopped. And Hitler would no longer attempt to attack Britain. And this was successful. And this proved to be probably one of the major losses to uh, Hitler. So as Hitler is um, attacking, he also has an agenda of attacking Soviet Union. And remember, he had made a, an agreement. He made a deal with the Soviet Union saying that they were going to be neutral with each other. They weren't going to attack each other. And pretty much... He breaks this agreement, and he breaks it through something called Operation Barbarossa. So on June 22nd, 1941, Hitler is going um, to order his troops to invade the Soviet Union. Uh, they will acquire Hungary, Finland, and Romania, and they'll declare war on the Soviet Union. He'll break, like I said, his agreement, his non-aggression pact that he had made with Stalin. And because um, remember, he said he wouldn't invade. He'll break this. And Stalin is surprised. Stalin is shocked that he broke the pact, you know, because he thought this was um, this was serious. This was a serious agreement that they made. And the Germans will make their way all the way into the gates of Moscow. But um, the by this time, Stalin has already, you know, told the industrialists, the people in the factories, you need to move out of here and you need to go further north um, to prepare and supply us with armament. So the Blitzkrieg attacks were not successful in the Soviet Union, this whole full-on force. And the reason for that is because it was just too large of a territory to take that kind of tactic on. So the Soviet Red Army will strike back to the Germans thanks to heavy industry and help from the Allies. So because he was smart enough, Stalin, to move the industry up north, they were able to kind of regroup, rebuild, create the art the um you know the weaponry they needed create the ammunition they needed in addition coupled with that they had the u.s support as well so they were really able to uh push back the germans in addition to this um the other reason that the germans were not successful was because of the heavy winter that occurred in the soviet union hitler didn't think it was going to take that long to conquer or to take over the Soviet Union. And so when winter hit in the Soviet Union, the German army was ill prepared for this. If you remember your history, we see this also with Napoleon who was trying to take over Russia. His army was not prepared for the winter. And so the Germans were unprepared for this weather and they just had to, you know, pull back. So the Germans attempted to regroup and strike back, but the Soviet army was able to barely hold them off. So that's really what's happening on the Western front of the war in World War II. Now we're going to move to the Eastern uh, front in the Pacific, 
and we see this with the battles in Asia and the Pacific. So first with Pearl Harbor. So seeing the German victories led the Japanese to expand in the area of Southeast Asia. The Japanese had already allied themselves by this time with um, the Germans. And they see what's going on. They, from what they know, the Germans are doing good. They're conquering lands. They're getting territories under the Reich. And so for them, it, everything looks great. So Japan began to occupy the French Indochina, which was German-controlled France and the government by this point. And the U.S. will respond because they pretty much know what's going to happen. They know what Japan's intent is. Um, so the only thing they can do is really they can freeze Japanese assets and impose oil embargoes, meaning that they're not going to sell them oil. And that will hopefully help them to stop the Japanese. But the way the Japanese saw it is we have two choices here. Either we adhere to what the U.S. is doing and we do stop because we don't have resources or we go to war with them. And in the eyes of the Japanese, they thought war was the best option. They actually thought they could win the war. And they obviously had a plan with the attack. So they chose war. Hideki Tojo, he's the prime minister. His hope and his plan was to destroy the U.S. naval capacity by attacking Pearl Harbor and create a Japanese defensive perimeter. So. His plan is, okay, first we go attack the Navy, all right, we'll weaken the U.S. Navy, and then while, you know, they're regrouping, restarting, we're going to create kind of like a blockade, a defensive perimeter around the area so that they won't come and try to stop us from getting most of the Pacific. Um, this obviously will work for a time because the U.S. will be hindered and have to, you know, fix their ships and that kind of thing. But later on, we'll see that um, the U.S. will come back. So Hitler and Mussolini will declare war on the U.S. They're like, well, he's already, you know, taken down Pearl Harbor. He's already bombed them. So, yeah, we're going to declare war. And obviously then the U.S. is like, well, we're going to go ahead and declare war on Germany and Italy, too. So Japanese victory. So after Pearl Harbor, like I said, the Japanese for a time would be successful in their agenda. And they would continue their victories. They would get Philippines, Guam, the Wake Island, Midway Island, Hong Kong, uh, Thailand, and British Malaya. So the Japanese were using the rhetoric Asian for Asia for Asians. And what this meant that was when they would go into these lands and they would take over, they were saying that they were doing it for all of Asia. But the reality is when these people were there and they saw how they were being treated by the Japanese, they were like, this is not an Asia for Asians. This is an Asia for Japan. And it really turned their mindset otherwise as to wanting to be a part of this or even supporting the Japanese. So the occupation of the Japanese by the Japanese was often brutal conquest and it proved otherwise to be something for all Asians. So the defeat of the Axis powers. How does World War II end? So the Allied victory in Europe we see in 1943, the Soviets will retake Russia. In 1944, the Soviets will also not only retake it, but they will begin to push the Germans back and they'll advance into Romania, Hungary, and Poland, and finally into Berlin. The U.S. and the British, they'll attack the Germans in North Africa and in Italy. So we see that then Germany is beginning to have almost a two-front war. Well, they do have a two-front war, almost a three-front war, if we look at the geography of it. And then Italy... They leave the Axis powers to join the Allies. They kind of like are like, oh, you know what? We were wrong. We did wrong. So we're going to flip and we're going to join the Axis, the Allied powers. On June 6, 1944, U.S. troops will land on the French coast of Normandy. And uh, the Germans are just overwhelmed by all the soldiers that are there that day. Um, and again, having to fight two wars. The U.S. and British Air Force begin to attack on Germany as well, and this will pretty much bring them to a point where they are being closed in on both sides, and their territory has now contracted. So this will pretty much end the German rule, or the German conquest at that point. Looking at the Pacific, we see that uh, they came in the area of the Midway Islands, so the United States, after they kind of regrouped and everything, 
they had to have a plan of attack. And what they did was something called island hopping. So they were moving from one island to another. But they had to do this first by knowing what the um, agenda was for the Japanese in advance. And the cryptographers were the ones that did this because they broke a Japanese code that was planning an attack on Midway. So when the U.S. kind of found out this, you know, code and they're like, oh, well, they're going to go to Midway next, then they had planned, okay, well, we need to send our troops there. And what pretty much they did was they would, you know, go to that island, take back the island, move to another island, take that back, and they would do this kind of island hopping. So the U.S. countered this uh, attempted attack, and it, like I said, it changed the war in favor to the U.S., and they would do the island hopping strategy. And they would finally get close to the islands of Iwo Jima and Okinawa. So, with the Japanese seeing that their strategy was no longer working, they were beginning to lose the battle, they got desperate. And we see kamikazes, which are volunteered suicide uh, mission pilots who had just enough fuel to get them to hit, um, I guess, a naval ship and kind of just destroy, I mean, they're committing suicide, essentially, is what's happening. Uh, it convinced the Americans that the Japanese would not capitulate, meaning they're not going to give in. They're not going to surrender. If they're willing to send their pilots with just enough fuel, these are suicide missions, and they're not going to give in that easily. Uh, we also see napalm bombings also happening to kind of try to get the Japanese to surrender. And then finally, we see the atomic bomb drop on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, August 6th and 9th, 1945. So kind of important that you know this, and maybe you already do. But, um, you know, it's not like the U.S. just said, we're just going to drop these bombs on you. The U.S. gave the Japanese the opportunity the first time on August 6th. They said, this is what's going to happen. This is what we're going to do. We have this, you know, nuclear capacity will you surrender? And they said no. So on August 6th, they dropped the first bomb. Again, after they saw the devastation, the Japanese, they told them again, are you going to surrender? We have another bomb. We're going to drop this on you. If you do not surrender, then we will have to drop it on you if you do not surrender. And again, they said no. And that's when the second bomb hits. So don't think that the U.S. did not give them opportunity for surrender. Um, they did, just the Japanese did not accept it until after the second bomb drops. So the Soviet Union um, will then declare war on Japan, creating a two-front war, okay? And pretty much by this point, Emperor Hirohito, with the bombing, with having a two-front war, he will unconditionally surrender on August 15th, 1945. And this will bring um, the end of World War II, bring to an end the World War II. So that's pretty much how the battles played out. In terms of how life was during the war, we see a lot of exploitation and atrocities occur. Uh, they use their empires for economic gain and exploited land under the control regardless of the consequence. This is what the Axis powers were doing. They used the people there as slave labor. You would see atrocities being committed, especially on the Jewish people, such as vivisections. They'd try out, you know, germ warfare on them to see, okay, what happens when we get, when we um, release this germ warfare. They did experimentations on them. Uh, there was high altitude experimentations to see how long it took for somebody to die or pass out at what altitude it was, so they'd know how high to tell their pilots to fly. Um, also, also the same thing with the hypothermia experiments. Uh, with collaboration, there was a hated occupation, but went on with it, meaning that we know what's going on, but we really have no choice. Local notables often joined the occupied governments to gain power. One of those, if you can't beat them, join them kind of mentalities, and they also didn't want to be killed off because they didn't join them. Business people and companies joined for financial reasons. They saw the profit in it, even though they knew that they were you know, essentially being a part of murder. And then others turned in their friends and neighbors because they didn't want to get caught knowing they they knew that somebody else was maybe a Jew or against the war. 
there were some forms of resistance. Um, occupations took on various forms. This could include sabotage of, you know, the the uh, factory they were working in, guerrilla warfare, uh, destruction of ammunition uh, dumps as well. So there was these attempts, these small ways of resistance that we see, again, similar to, you know, where, I guess, in the encomiendas, that they would kind of sabotage and do these similar things in that respect. Destroying of communication and transportation as well. And um, non-compliance was, of course, another form of resistance and considered a form of treason. So, again, all these attempts are going to be there. They're going to prove to be very futile in nature, but they did exist. So, the Holocaust. Um, the final solution. So, Germany will go into Poland and they'll occupy Poland and they'll invade um the Soviet Union will give Hitler the opportunity to get rid of the Jews. Essentially, we know that Hitler blames the Jews for the problems. And at first, you know, he will implement the Nuremberg Laws that really limits the freedoms of the Jewish people in Germany. And then he'll move to putting them in ghettos in small Jewish neighborhoods. You know, it's like hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people in a small neighborhood, in a small, you know, maybe square mile. In addition to that, when he finds that um, we're in the war and we need pretty much slave labor, then we see this idea of work camps come into play. And then, of course, lastly, the concentration camps where essentially you're there to work till you die. So before we get there... Um, the Jewish had something called the S. I'm sorry. The Germans had something called the SS Einsatzgruppen, and which what it was was the Nazi killing of Jews of Roma Gypsies and non-Jewish slaves. What begins to happen is that Germany just wants to get rid of the Jewish people, and they will kill them off. But when they're in the war, they begin to realize they're wasting their bullets on them, and they thought there has to be a better solution to this, a better way to save bullets and to still kill people off. And so what they come up with in the Wannsee Conference is um, they coordinate and implement the final solution, which was to move all Jews to eastern Poland into, into concentration camps. Um, and then we see the mass extermination through gas chambers. So essentially, instead of wasting our bullets on you, we're going to work you to death in these concentration camps. And if you are not fit to work, then we're going to put you in the gas chamber because you are of no use to us, even if we're fighting a war against you. Of course, Jewish resistance, best known uprising, was in the Warsaw Ghetto in the spring of 1943, but again, even that was stopped. And that's really the Holocaust, uh, briefly what happened in that time. And moving on to women and war, we see women's roles similar to those of World War I. They joined military they although didn't join the military service during then except that they were nurses but we saw more joining the military service even as nurses um again you're going to take the factory job the job that your husband had now you're going to take it you're going to be the head of household as well and um the roles often temporary until the husband came back but it gave them a sense of freedom so that was one thing on the other end, with comfort women this is quite the opposite so women were working in military brothels that's what they were and in order to comfort Japanese soldiers, they um, they pretty much took the Chinese women and essentially made them, not even prostitutes, just like essentially just use them to comfort them, use them pretty much there, just raping them. So often women of the occupied lands were the ones that were these comfort women. And women often were casualties of the war. They got killed, got a venereal disease. Um, it was very, very shameful time for them. Because the surviving ex uh, experience, the survivors experienced deep shame and at times shunning from the families. So it was like this happened to you, and you got pregnant, and the war ended, and you were home. You know, you finally found your family, and they saw you, and you were pregnant. It was very shameful, and even though they should be supportive, they weren't. So all of World War II will lead into the Cold War. The Cold War is about 50 years in history that 
it is essentially this idea of democratic countries being established versus communist countries being established. And it is that war between democracy and communism. And this really springs from World War II, because at the end of World War II, both the United States and the Soviet Union came out as the superpowers, and both felt that they had the rights to, um, I guess, push their agendas on the surrounding countries. And they all, all had their own reason for doing so. So this would bring about the Cold War. First, with the United Nations, we see that there's, after World War II, League of Nations, we know, didn't work out because obviously World War II happened. So they decided to start another organization, peace organization called the United Nations. And it was, again, dedicated to keeping world peace and security. And the Security Council for was there for maintaining international peace. You're going to have five members, you, essentially the ones, the allies, the U.S., the Soviet Union, Great Britain, France, and China. These are the five members. And then you have six rotating elected members. And whatever um, decisions they make, they have to be unanimous vote on all matters of substance. Anything that really is going to impact the world, they have to make a global decision, a unanimous decision on it. And the decision is binding. So the question of what, after World War II, the question was, what is going to happen to Poland? And the U.S. felt it should be free and democratic. And the Soviet Union felt, mm, not communist, but maybe we should play a role in influencing them. So the Stalin argued for a friendly government to safeguard against the German threat. That's what it was. So the Truman Doctrine was this new idea of a free democratic um, kind of policy that these countries should be able to decide whether they want to be a democracy or a communist country or an enslaved peoples, as they would say. So the Truman Doctrine was a U.S. interventionist foreign policy dedicated to the containment of communism. And that's very important, the containment, meaning that the countries that are already communists are already communists. We just don't want it to spread to other countries. That's essentially what the Truman Doctrine is saying. Keep it where it's at already and don't allow it to spread. So they tried to prevent further influence of the Soviet Union through the Truman Doctrine, but they kind of knew like, well, we can try and do this, but who's going to follow us? How are we going to incentivize, you know, being democratic? And so what they came up with was the Marshall Plan. And essentially what the Marshall Plan is, it's also known as the European Recovery Plan, it rebuilt European uh, economies through cooperation and capitalism, meaning that the U.S. was telling them, we will give you money to rebuild, to help you, you know, get started because of, you know, all the bad stuff that happened in World War II and how it destroyed your infrastructure and that kind of thing. We'll help you out. We'll give you money. And the policy was meant to avoid communist influence. That was really the underlying agenda. Yes, we'll help you, but remember, it's a democratic country that's helping you. And we would like you to maintain your democracy as well. So, again, that underlying agenda. We're not just helping because we're nice. So the Council, the Soviet Union, they will respond in turn with their own economic plan. And theirs was called the Council for Mutual Economic Assistance, or Comic-Con. And it offered increased trade with the Soviet Union and Eastern Europeans as an alternative to the Marshall Plan. So if you didn't want to get economic assistance from the dem Democratic Marshall Plan, then you could go to Comic-Con and you could get assistance there. We also see military alliances that begin to develop with the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, NATO. They will develop their own military alliance, and then we see Soviet Union respond with the Warsaw Pact, which signaled the militarization of the Cold War, meaning that, okay, now we have militaries. And um, remember, this is going to lead into the arms race as well. We will maintain peace in a post-war Europe was the idea, but we'll maintain peace as you see us building up our arsenal. So the Warsaw Pact was the countermeasure to NATO. The other thing that happens after World War II is they divide Germany up because they're like, obviously, Germany cannot take care of itself. Obviously, they go rogue and they do their own things. 
So the Soviet Union was pressured, uh, pressured Western powers to relinquish jurisdiction over Berlin. Essentially, it's Germany, and then it's cut in half. And then inside of, e there's West Germany and East Germany. The West is controlled by the U.S., Great Britain, France. And the East is controlled by the Soviet Union. And in the East, you have Berlin, the capital. And Berlin is again divided up into four pieces each um, country having a piece so the soviets blockaded um the western powers merged their occupied zones together and the soviets blockaded all road all road rail and water links between berlin and west germany and this will lead to a blockade and airlift so the americans and brits will respond by airlifts of food and supplies to west germany Okay, um, since everything was blocked off and they couldn't even get in by land because the Soviets blocked it off, then they will begin to drop food and supplies into their side of Berlin that way. And then in 1949, the Soviets will call off the blockade because obviously it's not working because they're just flying their airplanes over. The U.S., the Brits, and the France will unite their occupations into a federal republic of Germany known as West Germany. So now you have West Germany and then East Germany. And it was like that until 1989, guys. So if you look at a map older than 1989, you'll see a West Germany and an East Germany on the map. So Soviets started the German Democratic Republic, known as East Germany, and this would include Berlin. So what's happening once these countries officially get divided into two separate countries, um... East Germany will build a wall because it begins to see a lot of its people leaving to the democratic side. And so to prevent this, they build the Berlin Wall. And the East Germans will create a fortified wall to keep Germans from leaving. And it stopped refugees from leaving, but it brought shame to East Germany. Pretty much saying, like, you're forcing people to live there. You're breaking up families. You're killing people if they try to escape. Uh, it brought a lot of shame to them. And that's essentially what's happening with Germany. When we look at China and the Soviet Union, we see the birth of communist China. Remember I told you in the very beginning of this that when they were trying to fight off the Japanese, the peasants, they appreciated the communists more because it looked like they were making a more effort. So after the war ended, we see communism really take hold in China and it will take over. And the Soviet Union will gain an ally. So now... It's like, okay, we're not the only ones. We're not the only communists. So the Soviets and the Chinese will ally themselves. And in 1948, a civil war will break out in China against the Nationalist Party, which will bring in the Communist Party, forcing the Nationalist Party to leave and seek refuge in Taiwan. And by um, August 1st, 1949, the People's Republic of China will officially be created as the China you know it today. So China and the Soviet Union had close ties in the early part of the Cold War. And um, they were like, you know, together. They were really strong allies. And they had the same enemy, the U.S. The democracy was the same enemy. They were concerned as to how the U.S. was aiding former enemy Japan and other states such as Taiwan and South Korea. They didn't like that the U.S. was, you know, helping rebuild a country they destroyed. They felt that was wrong. They felt they were the enemy and they remained the enemy. So uh, Beijing, China reorganized Soviet's authority and world communism in exchange for military equipment and economic aid, meaning that we will recognize you as the main communist authority if you help us out. And so that's how their agreement worked. So the confrontations in Korea, this is essentially the Korean War. So what happens is that hostilities in Korea um, begin to rise in 1950, and the Soviet and the U.S. will divide the area of Korea in two at the 38th parallel. So everything to the north belonged to the Soviets. Everything to the south was democracy in the United States. In the south, you had the Republic of Korea. In the north, uh, the People's Democratic Republic of Korea. 1950, the north attacked the south. And the U.S. provides aid and pushes the North back. So the North, they'll come all the way down to the South, get a good chunk of it, 
the U.S., they'll see what's happening. They'll push back and they'll try to push even further into the into North Korea because they think they have the opportunity to um, gain the whole area, the, all of Korea. And it, what's going to happen is that the the North will also push back and it'll pretty much the war will not end, but the there will be a stalemate back at the 38th parallel. So the war ends in the stalemate. To this day, there is a stalemate. There has never been agreed upon armistice. There has never been an official ending of this war. And it developed CETO, which is similar to NATO. So the Southeast Asian Treaty Organization. So the way NATO, it's a military alliance. CETO, also a military alliance, but in this area, in the Pacific. So the globalization of the Cold War. Cracks in the Soviet-Chinese alliance. So remember I told you that the Soviets were happy because the Chinese were communists and they made this agreement to each other. Soviets are being recognized as the prime authority of communism. And in exchange for that, they're going to help the Chinese, you know, economically. Well, the Chinese are kind of getting tired of it because they don't feel like the Soviets are really helping them, that they're not getting enough economic aid. So the Chinese felt that the Soviet aid was far too modest and too many strings were attached to it, meaning that you're going to give us this aid, but you want us to do A, B, and C for it. So both complete, uh, both competed for influence in Africa and Asia, and China will enhance prestige by attempting their own nuclear tests. So then we see the entrance of the nuclear arms race, which was a central feature of the Cold War. Um, the U.S. and Soviets created large arsenals of nuclear weapons and systems on deploying them. And you just see this arm race build. We have more nuclear arms. No, we do. We do. So much nuclear power that it led to mutually assured destruction, also known as MAD, meaning that it got to the point that these two countries, Soviet Union and the U.S., had so much arsenal, nuclear arsenal, that if it ever went to war, if they ever went to war with each other, it would be mutually assured destruction, meaning like, for sure, we're going to pretty much wipe out, you know, each other. And that was a scary thing back then. And people were always worried about that where are we going to go to war because this was a cold war meaning that there was no true formal war between the soviet union and the u.s but there was proxy wars and there were other things like these alliances being developed but there was never true war between the two that's why it was a cold war so cuba and the nuclear flashpoint they closed uh closest time to unleashing nuclear capabilities was in cuba meaning that there was one point where we thought we were really going to go to war with the Soviet Union, and that was when um, Cuba let the Soviet Union place uh, missiles on their land. So Fidel Castro overthrew the, compla the complacent leader to the U.S., Le uh, Fulgencio Batista y Zaldivar, and um, essentially Fidel Castro overthrows this leader. He comes into power. The Soviets see this. They say, hey, look, we'll support you. We'll give you economic aid. Let's put these missiles here. Fidel says, yes, okay, help us out. We need help, and we'll let you. It happens, and Fidel will accept the Soviets' offer of massive economic aid, and, this will, and he will openly support the USSR by doing this. So now you have a communist country even closer to the United States, and this really worries the United States. So JFK will attempt to invade Cuba, um, invade Cuba and try to overthrow Castro. He thought he would have more supporters. So essentially what happens is they plan this like secret attack on Cuba. And he had rep these Cuban refugees. He trained them. The CIA trained them, armed them and said, okay, we're going to fly you back into Cuba. We want you to get support and we want you to overthrow Castro. Well, the support was not there when they got there. And this threw them totally off guard. And the CIA did not get an uprising the way they wanted. And they did not get any, get any aerial support. And the invasion was a total unsuccessful invasion. So the Latin Americans lost prestige in the U.S. By seeing that actually they lost this Bay of Invasion. And the Cubans were the ones who gained the support. Then this pretty much made them lose all real, like, um pride, you could say, in the U.S. So it strengthened Castro's position in Cuba, and then on October 8, 1962, the U.S. learned of the Soviets' intent to place nuclear missiles in Cuba. 
And the JFK pretty much told the Soviet Union the way I told you how he was going to give them aid and everything. JFK told the Soviet Union that, you know what, if you don't get these missiles out, then something's going to happen. The ultimatum to withdraw missiles from Cuba or else, meaning the or else was war. So Kennedy imposes a naval and air quarantine. So he was trying every way not to go to war. First thing he does is this naval and air quarantine, meaning like no ships could go into Cuba, come out of Cuba. No um, airplanes could fly into Cuba, out of Cuba. And Kennedy will impose this. In return, the Soviet leader, Nikita Khrushchev, he got an open pledge from the JFK stating he would not attempt to overthrow Castro and his regime. So what ends up happening in the end is that they kind of both have to make some sort of concession. And Khrushchev says, look, we'll remove them, but Castro stays and he, and you let him be a communist. And JFK says, okay, but remove them. And so it's kind of how it ends. That was, And that whole situation with the missiles being there, that was known as the Cuban Missile Crisis. All right, so dissent, intervention, and reproachment, destalinization. So essentially destalinization, after Joseph Stalin dies, um, you're going to see a lot of communists, they're going to begin to speak out against him and say, like, what a terrible um, life they led while he was in power. And this will begin a period of destalinization where in 1956 to 64, there's going to be a thaw in government, meaning an ease in government. It's not going to be so strict. It's not going to be so fascist and so autocratic. And they'll begin to release uh, POWs, prisoners of war. The Soviet intervention. So tempting communist leaders elsewhere to not be so independent on Soviet intervention. We see Eastern European states, they'll try to be uh, their own masters. Because in Eastern Europe, you had heavy influence of the Russians there. And so they'll try uprisings to get rid of the communism that was kind of influencing these Eastern European countries. And the Soviets will come up with this policy called the Brezhnev Doctrine. The Brezhnev is the leader at this time, the Russian leader at this time. And what it is, is it says that the Soviets have the right to invade any socialist country deemed to be threatened by internal or external elements hostile to socialism. Essentially saying that similar to um, the Monroe Doctrine or the Roosevelt Corollary, actually, in that if something is happening in these little eastern countries that we influence that looks like it's going to harm you know our socialist communist um intentions then we have the right to go in there into these little countries and stop it all right so very similar to the roosevelt corollary in that corollary in that way then lastly we see the detente so the detente is essentially a reduction in hostility and it's a trying to cool the arms race and slow competition in developing countries and it's a relaxation of the cold war tensions and new cooperations so again at the end of, kind of towards the end of the cold war not really there's still about maybe like mm, a few years left of it we have a whole 80s the decade of cold war still uh but there's a detente and the detente means it's um a reduction in hostility and easy an easement of it so the idea that, you know what, we can't be doing this. We can't be having these armed races. We can't be having this total, um, you know, tension with each other all the time because it's very much affecting the world and the societies that are um, being put at the forefront of this. So we have a time of detente occurring. All right, guys, so that is it. I know it was a ton, a ton of information, and we'll be going into it in more detail uh, this week. So just um, – Keep that in mind. But again, you really got to understand the Cold War because that's 50 years of very recent history that we covered. All right. We will see you guys later.